All right, so we are going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19 today. 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, I want to share with you kind of the genesis of what I'm going to preach today because the message that I put together today is something that I've been thinking about for a couple of years. And I titled it Christmas Hangover. Okay, last night they laughed. I didn't think it was funny either, so I'm with you. Uh, I titled it Christmas Hangover because several years ago, uh, a couple of friends and I were talking about preaching and not liking to preach the, the same old Christmas story scriptures at the holidays because everyone knows them and, and it just it felt like uh, we were always doing the same thing. And that conversation kind of uh, turned into a discussion of what, what I call a Christmas hangover, what I call after the holidays, ugh, or not only the holidays, but after any big event. Um, one of the things I always deal with married couples uh, when I'm doing premarital counseling is, you know this feeling you have now might not be exactly the same feeling you have two years from now. Um, or when you get a big job, and you, you, you tried to get this new job, and then you get the new job, and you're real excited, and then a few months later you realize it's still a job. Um, you know, there's always these big exciting moments, and then there's this letdown. And one of my friends I was talking to that day several years ago said, I think that's just because we make these things about the wrong things. We make it about secular things, and if we would keep our eyes on Jesus on the holidays, we wouldn't have a Christmas hangover. And I said, I think there's something to that, but I don't think that's completely the truth. And now, several years after that conversation, I know that's not completely the truth. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you a perfect example. I had family in town for the holidays. And I don't think it is unbiblical or unwarranted for me to be excited to spend time with my grandchildren and then be sad when they leave. That's a normal reaction. So, so some of this letdown is, is kind of normal, but it's still important that we kind of think about how we handle it and how we deal with it. The other reason I know it's not all because we're focused on the wrong things, again, although I think there is something to be said for us focusing on the wrong things and making that skid worse, okay? The other reason I know it's not all that we're only focused on the wrong things is because I see the exact same thing happen in 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, I have preached 1 Kings chapter 18 a bunch. It's one of my favorite scriptures, and I've talked about it a lot, and I use it a lot as an example. Because 1 Kings chapter 18, the second half of it, is the story of Elijah, the prophet, on Mount Carmel. And if you know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, if you don't, I'll recap it quickly. Uh, Jezebel is Ahab, Ahab's wife. Ahab is the king of Israel. He's the worst and most evil and most vile king in Israel's history. That's according to the Bible, not according to me. And his wife is Jezebel, and his wife worships Baal, and she doesn't love God, and she rounds up all of God's prophets and has them killed. She's in the, the habit of doing this. And so Elijah, the, the prophet, challenges the prophets of Baal to um, all I can call is it, it's a pray off. We're going to pray and see whose God is bigger. And so he invites 450 prophets of Baal and some other prophets from another, another uh, ancient Near East deity. He invites all these prophets to, to this competition. And he says, there's just me and there's 450 of you. You go first, go ahead and and." Get the bull on the altar and get it ready, and then you pray, and we'll see if God shows up. And so they're praying for days, for a whole day, 24 hours, I think it says. They're just praying and praying, and they're, they cut themselves. And then Eliza kind of makes fun of them. The Hebrew word he uses is resting. He says, perhaps your God is, is resting. But, but the Hebrew word literally means relief. And the New Living Translation says, maybe your God's using the restroom. That's why he's not here. Okay, so, so it's a funny scripture, and it's a, so after a day, God doesn't, Baal doesn't show up. Spoiler alert, because he's not real. Baal doesn't show up, 
And so Elijah says, all right, you guys ready? My turn? Okay. And he prays. First of all, he pours water all over the altar and everything, just to be dramatic, I think. And then he prays, Lord, uh, I put us in a bad position here. You better show up. And God, fire comes down from heaven, burns up the altar, soaks up the water, burns up the offering. And Elijah says, see, I won. And then he kills the 450 prophets of Baal. Okay? So it's a cool story. It's about the power of God. It's about faith. It's, it's awesome. Pretty good day at the office for Elijah, don't you think? Yeah. The next scripture is what we're going to look at today. Because the very next scripture says, Jezebel gets mad and says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And guess what Elijah does? <laughs> what? He literally runs off crying and hides. He just killed 450 prophets of Baal. I don't understand why he doesn't just say, fine, bring it, lady. But he doesn't. And we see this example of someone who has the most amazing spiritual experience, the most amazing practical. This isn't just a spiritual scripture. This is a practical teaching. The most amazing event happened in his life, and then whew, down he goes. And, and so I think it is a very practical example for how we handle those letdowns. So, starting in verse 1, chapter 19, we're going to cover 18 verses here, but it goes pretty quick. It's really broken up into only three sections. So, verse 1, chapter 19, it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that, like that of one of them. So she threatens to kill him. Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went another day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. So, I think in this opening section about his, his decline into doubt, there is some important things that we need to look at. Okay? The first one is, Jezebel was scary. I mean, I don't want to belittle, and and by the way, I'll mention this in a minute, God never belittles the problem. God never says, ah, just stand up to her, okay? She was scary. She had a history of putting prophets to death. This is a woman who, when she says, I'm going to kill you, you end up dead. There's another story, a few uh, chapters after this, Naboth's vineyard. A Jewish guy, Ahab, wanted a piece of land, and a Jewish guy said, you know, I can't sell that to you because God gave that to my family. It's our inheritance. And she has him killed. So, so Jezebel is someone to be reckoned with. That's the first thing is that some of these doubts and some of these things that cause us to, to feel bad aren't necessarily wrong. Again, I'll use my grandkids leaving you know, it, it would be very, you would think I would be a strange person if I said, oh, thank God those grandkids are gone. Yeah, that, that's not what, that's not normal. So some of this is, is going to cause us difficulties, and we need to recognize that up front. Okay, here's the other thing. He laid down under a tree and went to sleep. I think the guy was worn out. There's a reason that God tells us to take a Sabbath. And we need to be serious about getting rest when we need it and about recognizing when we need rest. And I think it makes us more susceptible. Again, uh, with Christmas just being gone, you know, if you have family in town, you're up late with them. You're probably up early wanting to get things done. You're running around doing things during the day. You're busy, you're busy, you're busy. You're going to be tired. So know that and pay attention to that. He was tired, no doubt about it. Now, But here's the third thing. It says, he was afraid. And I say this almost every week, but it's true. When you translate from Hebrew to English or Greek to English, sometimes you lose things. And this word for afraid is lost in translation. Because the word here for afraid is um, the Hebrew ra'ah. And ra'ah is translated often just to see. 
to see something. Uh, it also means to uh, evaluate something. So basically what, what this word in, in Hebrew means is that she, she threatened him, and he looked at it and said, yep, she's going to kill me. And, and he, you know, he believed it. He, he took stock of it. Okay, But here's the thing. What I want to know is why he was looking at that instead of looking at the fact that he just killed 450 prophets. Why was he looking at that instead of looking at God saying, God's not going to let this woman kill me. Why was he looking at that instead of realizing or looking at the fact that God had already prophesied that God was going to kill her? Okay, She was a bad woman. See, yes, he's looking at it and he evaluates it and that's fine. But the reason he was afraid is because he was looking at the wrong thing. And um, again, I planned this sermon before I really, actually the, the genesis of the sermon was before I even had grandkids. So I'm not trying to make this whole thing cathartic about my grandkids leaving and me being sad. But instead of looking at the fact that my grandkids are leaving, I could look at the fact that I got to spend a week with them. Right? I could look at the fact that I am as blessed as I am to have two of them. If you're Facebook friends with me, you saw the picture with the Chiefs jerseys raising them kids right. I'm focused on the wrong things if all I'm looking at is the fact that they're leaving, right? That's what he was, he, it's a real thing. It's not that he shouldn't be afraid at all, but he's focused on the wrong thing. And that's what we see in that word. That's what made him afraid. He was only looking at the bad. He wasn't taking in the good with it, okay? And then we have what I think is the most telling point here because he says, and I quote, uh, I am no better than my ancestors. The Jews had a long history at this point of messing up. From the moment the Jews walked into the promised land, they did almost nothing but be disobedient, 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 disobedient. And Elijah, even though he is following God, listening to God's call, one of the most amazing and powerful prophets in the Old Testament, when, it, when push comes to shove, he says, I'm going to end up just like my dad. That's what he says. And folks, that's a lie of the devil. There's a cycle that occurs in a lot of families where the same mistakes just get made over and over and over and over. We see it all the time. All of you know what I'm talking about. Folks, in Christ you have freedom to break that cycle. And when you get tired and when you get down, that's when Satan whispers in your ear, you're going to screw up just like the person before you. You can't help it. You can help it. And, and even though he didn't have Christ to lean on, we know that he was a man who was looking ahead to what God was going to do. He had faith. He knew he could be different in God. We know we can be different in Jesus. When the gospel talks about freedom, this is why Jesus died because you don't have to make those same mistakes. But when we get down, that's when we begin to believe the lies. Okay? So, so this was what was, was working on him. And, and it's important that we recognize all of these things so that we kind of know how to fix it. So let's keep going. Starting in uh, the middle of verse 5, it says, uh, All at once an angel... That's kind of an all at once. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, where he went into a cave and spent the night. Now, this is kind of a transitional section into what I think is the nuts and bolts of this thing, but there is so much here. I could spend weeks just talking about those couple verses. A couple key points I want you to make sure you grab onto. First of all, he says, the journey is too much for you. One of the reasons I think we get ourselves in trouble after a big moment is because the big moments reinforce the lie that I can do it myself. The big moments teach us falsely 
that I, I'm in charge. I don't need other people's help. I don't need God. Now, none of us believe that, but a lot of us think God's going to bless me, but once he blesses me, then I'm okay. I can do it. And, and I used to say, we, you know, it's, it's a John Wayne mentality, but young people don't necessarily know what that means. We have this idea in America of rugged individualism being the highest uh, virtue. It's not. We were not made to do almost anything alone. We, first of all, were made in the image of God to be connected to God. And all the things that we undertake in life should be through God. He's the one who guides us and teaches us. But here's the other thing. We were made to be connected to other people. One of my favorite things in the, in the beginning, in the creation story, is when, now God puts it nicely. He says that Adam was naming the animals and no, no suitable helpmate was found as he was naming them. What that really says is, he wasn't very good at it. He needed somebody to help him. I'm going to call that one. I already got a horse and a cow. You know, he needed somebody to say, okay, honey, we can be a little more creative here. He, he wasn't good at it. We're not good alone. And, and I know that's easy to look at man and woman and, and make that connection from the Bible, but I think it goes with the whole body of Christ. When you get the New Testament, it talks about gifts. One person's good at one thing, one person's good at another. If everyone was an eye, how would we hear? Or if I was only an eye by myself, how would I hear? We need the people around us. But when we have moments of success, we think, ah, I did it, I've arrived. And we isolate people. We isolate God. We think now, I've got to figure it out. And then when we crash, who's there to pick us up? Nobody. So he says, your journey is too much for you. We have to dispel the myth that we don't need other people. You have to dispel the myth that we're trying to achieve some, some uh, standard of oneness that I can handle things. We can't. Just own that and enjoy the journey with other people. Okay, but then the other thing here is, okay, so he lays down and he wakes up and there's food and water there. Where'd it come from? Oh. Now, it doesn't actually say the angel created it. Does it? Just says the angel woke him up to eat. Doesn't say the angel brought the food. Doesn't say the angel brought the water. Doesn't say anything. It just says the angel woke him up. Okay? Sometimes I think, and I, have to, I want to be very careful here, but sometimes I think that we fail to include the supernatural in our thought process. And, and I, again, I want to be very careful here because I think the church has falsely split itself in two directions. One direction, people don't believe in the supernatural at all. Yes, God is real, but, but what? If, if you believe in God, there's got to be some level of, of input that he has. Something supernatural or spiritual can and will occur. Okay? But then there's another wing of the church that says everything is super spiritual. And they hyper-spiritualize everything. And I'm here to, to argue, and I think in this scripture what you see is that it's never either of those extremes. It's always both and. Those things are always going on simultaneously. Jesus, when Jesus made food for 5,000 people, remember those two stories, 5,000 to one, 4,000 in the other. Jesus, the disciples said, Jesus said, hey, these guys are getting hungry, let's feed them. And the disciples said, well, we'll never make enough food. Jesus did not say, well, if they focus on me, they won't be hungry anymore. He didn't hyper-spiritualize it. He made actual real food, miraculously. The miracle and the practical went together. I think sometimes we forget that we were created in God's image and that God is acting in our lives, okay? And, and so what our role is is to do everything that we can do in our power. The scriptures say, be innocent as doves and wise as serpents. The wise as serpents part means that God told me what to do, I'm gonna do it. The innocent as dove part means I know God is real and I know he's also acting in this situation and I trust he's gonna show up. Both of those simultaneously, do all you can and, and expect God to show up. And in doing that, we'll be, we'll be remembering that there's always a bigger God picture going on to, to what we're going through. 
Maybe in that, in that valley that we're in, he wants us to learn something, or maybe he will be what shows up and builds us up. But we always have to keep that in mind. And I love the fact that he goes to Mount Horeb, which is um, the, the mountain of God. It basically says he, he went seeking after God. And that's the last thing and maybe the most important, but also the most simple. It was a 40-day and 40-night journey, and he went seeking after God. And then the next section is about how God lifted him up out of that pit. So let's move on and look at verses, the middle of verse 9 all the way to the end in verse 18. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him. Now, I want to remind you, he went to the mountain of God. So, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenants, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Okay, that's the first section. And then it says this. Then the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? <clears throat> he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehaloah to succeed you as prophet. When Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Now, I know this is a, a story about what's going on, but I also want you to see something in here. This is extremely poetic, and the poetry is in the structure, okay? Basically, God asks Elijah a question, and Elijah answers, and then God does something, and then he asks him the same question, and Elijah gives him the exact same answer. You see the poetry there? Two exact same things, and God does something different. So so the real story here is in what God does differently from the first time he asks a question to the second time he asks a question. That's where our our information is going to be found. Before we we jump into that, though, I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, God never, ever, anywhere in this, belittles Elijah's struggles. Okay, Nowhere in here does he say, hey, just get up and go, man. You just got to try harder. Now, I know that, that I, I quote Hebrews 12, 4 all the time. It says, in your, struggle in, to re, uh, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And I say what that means is you have to try harder. Yes, you have to try harder when it comes to not sinning. That's what, Jesus, that's what the author of Hebrews says there. But that doesn't apply here. God doesn't ever say, just get up and go. Come on, you can do it. Just go. No, he ministers to him. He loves on him. Nowhere in here does he, does he belittle him. And, and he asks him, why are you here? He takes his problems very seriously. This is important. Because if someone tells you, ah, just, just look on the bright side, I don't think that's coming from God. Now, that, that's part of the healing process, and that's part of maybe getting yourself back up after you've, you've had a letdown. But that's not necessarily of God, and that's not what God does here. Here's the other thing. Remember in the beginning of this, What was the problem? He saw Jezebel and he was afraid. Not anymore. Now, 
Elijah has developed a very accurate picture of what the problem is. Okay? Your people aren't doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. They're killing all the prophets, and now they're trying to kill me too. This is a problem. This is a legitimate problem. Okay? And, and it's not about scary Jezebel. So stepping back and kind of getting an accurate picture of what the problem actually is, is an important step in, in God ministering to you. All right? So he asks the question, he answers, uh, Elijah answers, and there are two separate things that happen here, and those are the two things you want to look at. The first one, the first one is, is kind of easy to see. Okay? God speaks to Elijah. And I, I think the fact that he goes through the, uh, uh, I'm a tornado, I'm fire, I'm a whisper, reminds us that God can speak in lots of ways. And he might not always speak real loud, but he will always speak. Okay, When he gets you where he wants you, when you've stepped back and had some rest and he's met your needs and you realize, I'm down, i got to seek God, he will speak. It's always the first step. And it doesn't always matter how he speaks. In fact, I think he speaks to everybody differently. I will tell you how he's going to speak to me. I, I almost think that I know because it seems to happen often. For me, it's always right here. I know other people who have the gift of intercession and they'll be praying and God will speak, but for me, it's when I'm reading the scriptures. Last year, I read the, the New King James straight through. Um, some, some years, I read the Bible straight through. Some years, I jump around. Some years, last year, I did something different. I read um, the Old Testament and the New Testament at the same time as I moved through with the devotional Bible. Never done that. I try to change translations. And so this year, I'm reading the ESV. And I know what's going to happen. After the holidays, I'm going to start. I'm not reading straight through. I'm jumping around. I don't even know where I'm going to start yet. But a couple days in, I'll read something, and God's just going to go, bam! He will speak. He always does. Okay? That's the first step. It's always the first step. It's not I speak. Remember, God always goes first. God created. A lot of us like to say, well, I, I accepted the Lord, and then he acted. Yeah, well, he died on a cross first. You accepted that. Yeah, but we were sinning, and then he came and died on a cross. Yeah, well, he made you. You know how far back you go, God was first. God always acts first. Okay? So that's the, the first step. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. That's what that says. And he will speak to you. Okay, so that's the first step. Hey, why are you here? I got this problem. God speaks. Okay? Then, hey, why are you here? I got this problem. Then God gives him a solution. And I love what he does for him. Okay? First of all, he gives him very, very specific instructions. Here's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to go back. I want you to anoint this guy and this guy and this guy. Very specific. I think God will give us specific things that will pull us out of our, our thing. I don't, I don't think God gives instructions like, well, just read the Bible more. I think God gives specific instructions like, I want you to do this ministry with this person. Or I want you to take on this project for this family member. Or I, want, I think God gives us specific instructions. Because when we're serving him in the ways that we're gifted, when we're following his instructions, when we're being obedient, we connect to him more. Okay? So he gives them, he gives Elijah specific instructions. So, so look for that. Here's the other thing. I said, one of, the, one of the things early we realized is, you're not alone. Your journey's too much for you. He gives him people to help. And he says, Jehu and, and, uh, and Elisha, Nice training program, the prophet training program for Elisha. He gets to kill people. That was funny. He says, I'm going to give you uh, Jehu and, and uh, Elisha and uh, who else? Oh, Hazael. Yeah. He gives him helpers. Now, just a minute ago, a couple, 40 days before this, Elijah had to kill 450 prophets. Now God said, I got other people to help you with the task of cleaning up all this debris. Okay? Not only will God give you a specific project, he'll give you specific people if you listen. 
Okay, finally, I love verse 18 because verse 18 is several things. In verse 18, he says, oh, by the way, I have reserved 7,000 people for me. So he does a couple things here that I think are really important. First of all, he gives Elijah a picture of the future. He says, here's where we're headed. But more importantly, he specifically and directly answers Elijah's concern. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a real concern. He says, you know, they're trying to kill me and there, there's nobody left. And God says, oh, I got somebody left. I got 7,000 people set aside that are mine. And how encouraging must that have been to get the big picture? Even if it wasn't the entire big picture, it was enough of a big picture. I think when we're down, if we'll listen and we'll focus on what God says to do, then he'll open up and he'll say, here's why you shouldn't be down, because I'm doing this. It's your way to get back up, okay? So, so this is what God does when he speaks to us. He gives us people, he gives us plans, and he, he lets us know his plan. And the, the, the real solution here for Elijah, because Elijah now just from here, he leaves and he goes and does stuff, and he tells, tells Jezebel to go pound salt, and he tells Ahab, you're gonna be dead too, and, and God's taking care of this whole thing, and he's himself again. And it's beautiful. Folks, and the trick I think is realizing we're the remnant. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Okay? My grandkids are leaving. But I'm, I'm tasked with teaching them about Jesus and loving them and letting them know that uh, I'm never going to, to leave them whether I'm with them or not. So i got to get on that mission. And that's the long-term plan. And so in, in that discussion with God, he'll build us up. Are you part of the solution? Or are you going to stay stuck in your problem? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for loving us. I thank you for such a, a wonderful, specific example in Elijah's life of uh, what it looks like to handle um, struggle like this. Lord, I pray that you would help us to hear your voice and focus on your plans when we're down. And I know, Lord, that, that you will build us back up. So, Father, help us to just step back and realize that that uh, we might be tired, we might be focused on the wrong things, but, but Lord, you are never going to leave us and help us to be a part of the solution, Lord, not just for ourselves, but for everybody who's going through the same thing. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen.